processes, a number of different platforms, and a number of different processing and, and uh, onboard intelligence AI technologies to produce an end-to-end -end or, or hardware and really uh, test capability um, in our case for, for space. So, did I say all that right? Yeah. Pretty close. All right. So Marco's going to fix anything that I, <laughs> that I, that I said. Looking for. All right. Good morning. My name is Marco Peterson. I'm representing both the Space Drones team and the Orbital Computer Vision team, uh, both out of the AOE department. Uh, this my presentation is going to be broken up into two parts. One, the first part is going to be about computer vision. So, optical satellite component tracking classification via synthetic CNN and its processing for on-orbit servicing and assembly. Uh, the large title, but we'll break it down. And then the second part of this. There's going to be a use of uh, robotic platforms for system validation. How do we assist validate those on orbit capabilities? All right, so the crux of this project uh, is a collaboration between the Hume Center and Dr. Pomodera's Phaser Lab. So, orbital construction and servicing. Uh, this is how we've done it in the past. We sent five missions up to the Hubble telescope to fix it. They've all used humans. In the 21st century, we could do this with robots. So, this is just a bunch of gifts of how we would put structures together up in orbit, and satellite and satellite services. All right, fundamental problem to solve for this project. How do we acquire the training data? How do we train it? And how do we push that information, make it useful for real-world manipulation? Either controlling thrusters, controlling robotic arms, so on and so forth. All right, development in the field. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar, uh, this is an NVIDIA Jetson. It came out about 18 months ago. It is the first piece of hardware that has now made it possible to do CNN neural networking on small edge case devices. For our case, it's a drone. The way this has been done in the past is you put a drone up and you download the video feed and you have to do the neural networking on a desktop computer that has a large GPU. This has an onboard GPU, so this drone can now fully autonomously make decisions on its own. And then, for those of you that are fans of the Mandalorian, uh, how would we go into this? There's no more green screens. They're just doing LED backgrounds, and this is very similar to, it's a very similar technology that uh, ICAT has, so we're going to use both of them. All right, computer vision today. Uh, in the past, we used to do the whole bounding box, move the box across the screen, try and find an object thing. We don't do that anymore. For better or for worse, the field of computer vision has been taken over by machine learning applications. Uh, so you have a bunch of neurons. Um, we're not going to go into the details of neural networking, rapid propagation, gradient descent, all the calculus. If you want to read that, you can read my dissertation. It comes out in May. Yeah. Uh, so once you push all your training data, you get something like this. Most people are familiar with this. Uh, identifying pedestrians, stop sign, uh, cars, so on and so forth. Uh, problem with this, this takes an incredible amount of data to train. In order to get this usable result, you need thousands upon thousands, in fact, hundreds of thousands of images to train a network to get a result that you want. We have a problem. For our, our special case, where does that data come from? There is no one floating around the International Space Station or on the surface of Mars with a camera collecting the thousands of images that we need to train a neural network to get a performance outcome that we want, i.e. this guy. This guy doesn't exist, at least right now. So what's the solution? Synthetic data. Uh, we're using the Unreal Engine. Uh, I'll explain those reasons in a minute. Some other teams have used Blender. And then there, there's another one out there. I'm getting the name of uh, a video game engine. Uh, so we created basically an orbital simulation. We got the International Space Station up there. A bunch of objects of, of interest. In our case, we have a bunch of structures. Uh, this is currently be run, being rendered at 32K. Um, so for those of you that are familiar, 4K TVs, yay, high super resolution. This is being rendered at 32K. Um, it does not make the computer happy, but it works. Uh, so the big picture, uh, find the object, objects of interest inside the general space, the synthetic space. And this was pulled out of uh, another paper. You see this horrible space drone picking up this truck and you know doing something useful with it, hopefully putting in the spot that it needs to be welded or bolted to. All right, how do we get there? So we need synthetic, synthetic data creation. We need to push it through a neural network, and then we need to do object classification and localization. 
Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with neural networks, this is the basic architecture you start out with an input, in our case, a picture. Um, do some kind of nonlinear convolution. Uh, so this is convolution layer, pushing that uh, image data smaller and smaller. You add your pooling layers, and then at the end of this, you should have some kind of output layer. Um, you'll have a neuron that says, hey, I'm 80% confident this is a truck, or I'm 40% confident this is a car, that kind of stuff. Um, so in our case, um, it's actually pretty, because we're not using black and white images, we're using RGB images. So it's, we're actually pushing 3D data for the neural network, and this is, again, what your output layer should output, depending on what you're trying to identify. And then you get something like this, traditional use cases. Uh, this is how it works here on Earth. Um, for our problem, we have a couple more issues. So um, this was pulled out of the University of Louisiana, 2019. Uh, due to density appearance, uh, illumination and background conditions, and difficulty of design. Computer vision in the space domain is difficult. Reason being, you're on dark side of celestial bodies, bright side of celestial bodies. The, the lighting illumination alone is a difficult problem to solve. Here on Earth, I'll use the project of autonomous driving. Almost everybody in the machine learning world is now working on autonomous driving. That data set already exists, but those guys get to cheat a little bit. Uh, most times you see a car, you're going to have either you're looking for the two tires or the three tires, you're looking for a windshield, uh, a grill, so on and so forth. And the car is almost always going to be in the same orientation. You're never going to have a car that's you know sideways, upside down, so on and so forth. In space, that 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 or, orientation can be pretty much any direction, and those are all problems that you have to solve for. Um, so how are, we, how are we trying to generalize the system? So there's people out there that are using something called domain randomization. So essentially what that is, is make the definition is if you domain randomize everything, it's just another permutation in the real world. Uh, it just identifies the same object in the real world. So um, again, uh, autonomous driving application, uh, these guys essentially made everything, they randomized lights, they randomized scale, they randomized colors, color patterns, so on, so on, so forth. And uh, you can see this is what they got. So in the world of computer vision, something called mean average precision is, um, is the standard benchmark on how you evaluate what architecture is and how you feed data into that architecture for training. Uh, these are various different architectures that they use, um, faster RNN, uh, F, RFCN, and PDD. Uh, this is the original key train set, this is what they got, and in some cases they approved, some they didn't. So 79 to 78, 71, 36 to 46. So it's usable, and then you really can't read these because they're blur, but these are all the different permutations of things that they tried. Um, altering lighting, altering texture, um, alter in color, so on and so forth. And the more things that they alter, the higher their mean average precision got. So how does this look like for us? This is what we did. Um, so our objects of interest, in our case, are the trusses. We threw them in the Unreal Engine. We don't do do randomize uh, the lighting. Uh, he's going to start the pre flight checks on the ground. Uh, lighting, color, so on and so forth. We put a bunch of distractors in there. We'll see, like, an F-16, F-18 dripping around. Um, I'm contemplating whether or not I'm going to leave the giant Pikachu in there for the journal publication. <laughs> so that's how we domain randomize our data set. Uh, this is explaining a little bit of what uh, mean average precision is. It's intersection over union. Essentially, the closer that your algorithm gets the bounding box to fit the ground truth, the higher your mean average precision gets. Uh, so these are results that yeah, uh, so this is our Unreal Engine. We ran a neural network on it. Uh, it picks up the trusses pretty much 100% because it's memorizing them at this point. It has all the solar panels uh, to pick up the Canada arm over here. And we took that data, and then we ran the exact neural network model on the helmet cams of astronauts climbing around the ISS. You'll see that at the end of this presentation. But uh, pretty much the only thing that we can identify in airspace that's also in our space is the solar panels. And then, you really can't see that either, but that's coming up to what, 90%, 97% confident that that's a solar panel. And that's being trained on synthetic data and synthetic data only. Uh, so these are the numbers that we got. Uh, we're up at 
78%, which is a jump from uh, the last team's 64. Uh, so a mean average, mean average precision of 78%. At a 50% match, like when the boxes overlay on top of each other, if it's more than 50%, the neural network will okay, like, yeah, I'll give this one to you. Uh, the more stringent case is 95%. Like the boxes have to be 95% overlap to each other, and then that's when the neural network will be able to, like, hey, yes, this is correct. And that's harder to do, which is why it's down there at uh, 59%. Uh, this is a confusion chart. I uh, wish we could read these labels, but essentially what this is doing is everything on the diagonal matches each other, right? 2U trust matches with 2U trust, 3U trust matches with 3U trust. If, all, if you have high numbers on the diagonal, you're doing uh, inferencing correctly. Uh, if you start getting numbers out here off the diagonal, um, you're starting to get false positives and false negatives. Uh, so how far can we go? Um, we got pretty good results. Inferencing things that we wanted to inference, I was wondering how far we could push the, the technology. So we have some defective trusses, um, 3D printers, whatever. I was like, can we start identifying uh, defective truss pieces? So this is a, a 3D truss and we zoomed in. Like these beams here are defects. We didn't put supports on them, so they started to fray out. Uh, pretty much every beam along the bottom is defective here. We only picked up two of them. So for this one, uh, what do we take? Like 250 images, and we attempted to train a network on it. It didn't come out very well. It's about 44%. So we found a limitation of the system. Either the architecture, or we can try and resolve this by pushing, you know, tens of thousands of image points and see if we can come up with a better result. And then uh, we came back to Virginia Tech uh, satellite team. So this satellite you see over here has a boom system, and one of their failure states is if the boom does not fully extend out in orbit. So we attempted to find if we can detect if it's only half extended or fully extended. Now in the lab, this works out pretty good, because we trained it in the lab. We trained it out on this table and we trained it in this, this uh, uh, white under black background. You'll see here in the presentation, it attempts to pick it up, but it's never been trained against the blue background, which is what's going to be up there. So you're going to find another limitation there. These are all things that we're starting to find out as we train these networks. Uh, and then Emerson, uh, our undergrad over here, he's come up with a cool idea to do synthetic. Um, so training these data sets, I had a team of undergrads over the summer uh, labeling uh, thousands and thousands of data points. Uh, which is time consuming to say the least. Um, Emerson's pioneering a, a new method to do it with LIDAR and photogrammetry overlay. So pick out the point cloud of the object you're trying to identify uh, and then label it and then you'll have the bounding box already around your image and then you can back out that data automatically in the, in the synthetic environment. Um, so we took that technology, paired it up with our international space station level. You can see we have uh, one, two, three, four trusses right here, and then he backed out the auto laser data over here. So it's a, it's a handy capability to have, and I hope to further implement in the future. All right. Now, now we're going to go through the drone flight. You ready, Menzen? Is that a yes? <laughs> okay. So there's going to be two. Um, is Jill up? Jill is up. There's going to be two flights, or two demonstration flights. The first one's going to be dem demonstrating the computer vision architecture. So this drone's going to go up, it's going to fly around, and you'll see the live uh, drone feed over here. You see the trusses on the floor. It's already interesting. Uh, two you and three trusses. Uh, he's going to pick it up. He's going to point the camera at the these trusses up here on the screen, the front and the trusses in the foreground. And the drone should be able to live reference those objects of interest. Ready when you are. Well, 
which is spotty at best. So, in order to solve that problem, we have to train a model on different backgrounds on a that, which again, is thousands of images. Alright, Tanner, can you get the lights? Who's got the lights? Alright, one of our uh, various problems is lighting. If you're on the dark side of a celestial body, i.e. Earth, and, you, you, and your structure goes on the dark side of the planet, you still need to be able to inference. So, with, we train the model with supplemental lighting, lighting, so you can still, you know, complete a construction task, even if you're on the dark side of a celestial body. Lights! All right, so that's flight number one. Um, flight number two is going to be a demonstration of the Unreal Engine up on the big screen PowerPoint computer. Ross Bridge Engine. I uh, don't think Ross Bridge is for the engine below. Yep. So, at the end of this presentation, uh, there is a, a problem between switching from PowerPoint to Unreal, but, there it is, uh, what you would see on this screen is the drone moving in real time inside the Unreal Engine. So that was the point of that demonstration, we'll try to get it back up here in a minute. Then you can go ahead and land. Oh, there it is. All right, well, we got it up. <laughs> you can uh, free flight again and hit the go button. So we can take real world objects and port them into a simulated environment. And later on, we, we can do this with multiple objects across multiple labs. The power of the Unreal Engine is a video game platform. So we, we can essentially have multiplayer. We can be flying a drone here inside the queue and interact with their robotic the phase of that. of this is that we're able to um, take advantage of the high-speed data links um, out of the out of the queue to other places. And so, um, correct, correct me if I was wrong. But what, one of the things that he was saying was that we could, uh, for example, fly a drone, <coughs> fly a drone in here, or fly a set of a swarm of them in here, and then interact with the robotic arm over at the phaser lab or uh, any other number of uh, remotes, <coughs> remotely accessible, remotely interactive. Uh, drones or other autonomous systems. Correct. All right, the next part of this is space is a complex place, and you can, for now, you can almost simply decide whether you want. So you want it to work the first time. So, how do we start validating the system? How does software start with hardware? How does hardware uh, interact with the environment? Oh, how good. The environment uh, interact with the sensor data, and how does that sensor data go back to the software and control your platform? Um, these top three, we can do. It's almost always the environment that gets in the way, especially in the space domain. You really can't simulate it very well. Here's some attempts to simulate it in the past. So these are the NASA cubes. Um, they're validating their system, what's called an air bearing table. It's 
basically a frictionless surface. So Newtonian physics, if you push something, it'll keep on going. Um, we can do this. Uh, we have a student that has simulated flight using the HCW equations with the drone. So instead of having two degrees of freedom on a flight air bearing table, you can pick the drone up, and now you have three degrees of freedom. You can push the drone, and it'll just keep on going until it hits, the, hits its safety bounding box, and then come back. So that's how Matt is doing it. This is the German aeronautics uh, facility. They're doing computer vision with essentially standing structures, robotic arms, platforms, so on and so forth, and this is how they're validating their systems. How we, this is how we're solving this environmental problem. Uh, and computer vision is called solving the reality gap. So we have the ICAT Q capability, and we're going to use it. So we can bring both of these screens down, uh, simulate an on-orbit environment visually, and then have the drone uh, simulate HCW equations on its onboard flight controller. Uh, so this drone solves your three years of freedom. You know, all your translations can be done in this drone. How do you solve orientation? Well, the, a researcher out of Sweden came up with this little guy called the Omni drone. So you can imagine this solves orientation for you. We have back there on the display table. So you can imagine multitudes of these flying around in a space like this where you have mock-up models of whatever you're trying to repair or construct up in space. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether that be satellites, structures, the shuttle, so on and so forth. So that is the overall simulation validation architecture. All right, and the, the system system isn't just for us. Uh, this space drone platform has now graduated three master's students, one PhD with several more in the pipeline. We've done everything from swarm, swarming operations to PID controllers. Uh, we've gone to several STEM outreach uh, fairs uh, and other in environments uh, throughout the state of Virginia. So we, we can do anything. So if you have a graduate student or a research opportunity and you need to have a drone that can fly today, we can provide that capability for you or if you'd like to improve upon the system. Minden's master's degree is an excellent example. The VR, or not off track, the VR tracking system that you see here that's been integrated into Ross on both sides of the room, that is a capability that was provided by Minden that is a capability that we're still using today. So what we're trying to avoid is your dissertation or your thesis ends up on a shelf and nobody uses it in the future. Uh, other applications. So Dr. Doyle is leading the the drone racing team. To reiterate, solving this problem, solving the drone racing problem, is something that's always been done in simulation. We have never had the hardware capable enough to do this on the fly on a drone. I'm not going to say we're the first team to do this, but we are one of the first teams to do this. So now what that opens the door up is, one, you can do it out there on the field in a drone cage, for example, but you probably don't want to do that. We have a graveyard of drone parts <laughs> that we've accumulated from attempting to do that. So what you can do here in the queue is play this exact same video, full screen, have your camera on the drone identify those gates as they come at the drone in real time. And test your motors and control to make sure that your drone operates here on a test stand in the queue, running through the actual course before you let it go to the actual course. And then the integration architecture. So we're using ROS. For those of you that are unfamiliar, it's called the Robotic Operating System. If you have an IMU, a GP, uh, GPS data, uh, sensors, whether that be cameras, LIDAR, so on and so forth, if it has a serial, UART, or USB connection, it can integrate to the ROS system, I can push that data out to anybody. We have a lo local uh, Space Drones network. So I, if you are logged into our Space Drones network, you can pull down your GPS data, your position data your orientation data. Any data that you want that is currently attached to the drone, you can pull down from the Space Drones network and do whatever analysis that you want with it. All right, lab to lab communication. Multiplayer. So the Unreal Engine is a gaming platform. You can implement multiplayer to it. So this what it allows us to do is you can take two different objects from two different labs and put them in the same Unreal environment and have them interact with each other or you can push that position orientation down directly to another lab. So 
you could have lab-to-lab -lab communication protocols. For example, the LS, which are a giant robot. That, the phaser lab has this giant space crane slash robot arm that's operating in their lab. And obviously, we're not going to bring that capability to the cube, but they can port the position orientation data here to the cube, and we can port out that visual information back to their facility. It's just one example of what's possible with the current system. All right, this is the team. Um, so, Bryant over there, this guy. Uh, if you have questions about integrating PyTorch into uh, Jetson products, he's your guy. If you have any questions about ROS architecture, you can either ask me or Minden. If you have questions about computer vision, uh, me and Dr. Doyle will be your guy. Uh, 3D printing and design and the ROS bridge, um, drone to Unreal Environment. Um, that was Minden. And then I have several undergrads back there in the back that have become very familiar with Unreal Engine and labeling this thousands of data, thousands of images that we need to make this automatic entrancing happening happen. And then we have Emerson over here who did your LiDAR the photogrammetry auto labeling. And then Derek. Derek is the owner of this client satellite that you see here. And then the Omnicop, which is in the back, is being headed up by Trissa, but she is not here today. Uh, this is where you can find all of our publications regarding space drones, space drones that we need at ep.edu, including the map this year. All right. Uh, this is just going to be a looping video of the Unreal Engine doing live referencing, and then it's going to port over to those astronaut helmet cams that I specified earlier. And you'll see the live referencing from that video. Is there any questions before I, I release you? the black. None. Cool. Uh, Minzen went one step further. He created a GUI for the drone. Um, he's going to give you instructions on how to specifically interact with that system on his tablet. But if the capability exists where you just push buttons and have the drone operate and have it go where you'd like to. There's no other questions. I'm going to go over there. Some, some discussion that we want to have. Are we going to do that in the background? Yeah, uh, but you, you need to use this space to then pop back. No, no, that's okay. I just want to make sure that we can pop. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, if, if anybody wants to try out a GUI and that's flying and then just stay behind that, I would Okay. Um, good. Thank you guys very much. Good. <laughs> so, uh, and I had a conversation with um...